There it is. Okay. There we go. All right. So, um, I was supposed to go to Israel in 2020, but COVID came and scrapped that. I was supposed to go with my congregation here, but that got scrapped. So, CGF Ministries does tour. They've done tours to Israel several times. If you guys want to go on a tour, I recommend going through CJF. Look them up. Um, I have some information I'll email out. If you guys really want to go on a really good tour, I highly recommend going with CJF. But, you know, you do what you want, but that's my recommendation, okay? And if I say it, that's the way it is, right? Um, just want to mention some about archaeology. It's gonna, we're going to be looking at some of the archaeology. Um I've always been a big archaeology uh, fan. I certainly am no expert, but I've had plenty of books <laughs> on archaeology for years. I mean, I've had, you know, books, books and books, popular level books, you know, um, advanced level books. Um, these are some of the books that I've had. I still have, you know, stuff on archaeology of the New Testament, Old Testament. But uh, there's a lot of debates in archaeology, of course. There's a lot of archaeologists who don't agree on certain things, and they have different worldviews and different perspectives. I'll talk about that. But there's a lot of good books on archaeology. These are some of the newer ones. I, I don't know if you guys remember. You probably don't remember this. I had Titus Kennedy on a Zoom call. He talked about the Exodus. Uh, it was about two years ago. Um, I think I had to remove that due to Titus's request. Something came up where I had to have the have that removed from my YouTube channel. But Titus is a man. If you want to get his books on the right here, there's another one Daniel Hayes wrote. But uh, there's some really good books, general level, introductory level books on archaeology. So good stuff out there if you want to go deeper. Um, this is a really good book that really critiqued... Uh, what, what happens in biblical theology is that sometimes we... When you study theology, when you get into like the deeper level stuff or you read books and you deal with the guys that do, are theologians or historians or archaeologists, sometimes they make a divide between theology and faith, whereas like they'll say, well, the theology of the Bible is what matters. Who cares if it's related to historical events, real historical places? We don't really know about that much about that. So who really cares in the end of the day? Because, you know, God's a theological the topic of God is theological, right? Stu theology is a study of God. But this book was a response to that saying that we need to be able to merge our theology and history together. They need to be merged together, okay? So that was a book that was written a ways back. Um, some of the slides I have here, I'm just going to mention, I did not um, create some of these slides. I did create some of them, but some of them would come from Joseph Holden, um, who has co-wrote this book with one of my former professors, Norm Geiser, on the popular handbook of archaeology. But I have his um, some of his slides on a few of the, some of these come from him. They're not all from me, so I don't want to take credit for some of them. But some of them are by half, half are mine, and I think he's got about maybe 20 in here that are his. So I just want to mention that. But anyway, I want to give him credit. Um, this is a good definition of archaeology. What I'm going to do is through this presentation, I'll talk about some of the archaeology, talk about a little bit about me in Israel, give you a few pictures of ourselves. I don't want to talk so much about myself, just I want to talk about some of the things I saw personally. And then I'll talk about Israel in the end, you know, what's going on there and, you know, what we need to uh, be praying about, of course, have some practical applications, okay? But this is a good definition of archaeology. Uh, archaeology is a study of the human past using material remains. These remains can be any objects that people created, modified, or used. Portable remains are usually called artifacts. Artifacts include tools, clothing, decorations. Non-portable remains such as pyramids or post holes are called features, okay? So definitely archaeology is a study uh, of the past, no doubt about that, from National Geographic. Whatever you want to think about them, that's a pretty good definition. Um, when it comes to archaeology, and, and an archaeologist, the guys that do this for a living, there's different schools of thought. Um, there's always been archaeologists that have basically sought out to be really critical of the Bible and really been skeptical of the Bible, whether it's recording real historical places and real events. And they're overall just very critical. Um, they're called minimalists. And I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more definition what a minimalist is. And then we have what are called maximalists. And that's more like a traditional approach that 
the Bible records real places, real things, and that corresponds to the archaeological record that they match. Okay, there's a correspondence between the two, and they're not quite as critical and uh, skeptical of the biblical text and the archaeological data. Okay, and there's some that just don't care. You know, they just study archaeology and they really don't have a stake in the game or whatever. But you know, the goal is to when you think about archaeology, it's to it's it's there to help kind of illuminate. The biblical record, yes, we worship God, but this is a God who acts in history. He, you know, there's a nation he called out called Israel in a real place, a real time, real people, real events. And why God decided to do this, I have no idea why he chose to dwell in a specific land with a specific people group that just as fallen as any other people group. And why he decided to do all his um, reveal himself in a very selected place. You know, I, I don't know why, but I'm not smart enough. That's why God's God and I'm hum I'm Eric, okay? But the, uh, like I said, archaeology certainly helps confirm the biblical record as being historical. And, uh, you know, it's like an apologetic tool we have in our arsenal. It's not the only thing that shows the Bible is the word of God. It simply shows the Bible's factual. Now, I talked about this a few weeks ago before I went to Israel about going over the reliability of the Bible. Archaeology is one thing you can use. It's not the only thing, but you... You know, it's one thing that we have in our arsenal, okay? Now, there are some objections to archaeology. Some people are just skeptical about history in general. Uh, some people think history is just not knowable. Um, it's kind of what we call a self-defeating statement. It doesn't meet its own criteria because you're really relying on your own historical knowledge to make that claim. But uh, some people are really radical and they just think, well, we can't know anything about history. You know, it's just it's in the past. We can't know anything. It's there's no way to get back there and we can't figure it out. And, you know, they're just really hyper skeptical. Um, sometimes the worldview of the archaeologist plays a role, the way they view reality, of course, whether they're an atheist or a theist, a Christian or whether they're they believe there's a God or whether there's just they're just a materialist or an atheist. That's going to play a role in how they look at the archaeological data. Um, a lot of times people say, well, you know, the evidence is just so fragmentary. And it is true. Most archaeological evidence is not exhaustive. I mean, some of it is, uh, you know, some of the places where I visited Jesus's events, the events of Jesus, you know, they're not 100% certain, you know, like, okay, this is exactly where Jesus his crucifixion was here and the, the empty tomb was here. It's, they're all possibilities. Okay. And there's evidence weighing in that says some, some locations are more probable than others. You know, I mean, it just depends, but you know, archeology, span remember all this stuff is from thousands of years ago. It's been buried. A lot of it erodes in the, over time. So, you know, we're, we're fortunate we can find anything. Um, some people may say archeology span is not like a science, but really it is a science because you're, your science is a study of the past as well as the present, but it studies singular events in the past, like archaeology does. You look at a singular event that happened; it's not repeatable. Like the Exodus isn't hasn't been repeated, or the creation of the world hasn't been repeated, or the time of Jesus and what he did isn't repeatable. That hasn't happened since, um, as far as him rising from the dead and stuff like that. So, archaeology is kind of like a science in a way. And then, you know, sadly. Some Christians, like I said, they make a big divide between their history and faith, where they'll say, well, you know, all we need is faith. I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in God. And it doesn't really matter whether any of the events in the Bible happen. And I once had a, uh, I once saw a, a debate between a Christian apologist and a guy, another guy over the resurrection. And the skeptical guy said, well, I don't think it really matters whether Jesus physically rose from the dead. All that matters is we have hope in our hearts. We have hope. And of course, that just doesn't make any sense. You know, you, you can't make such a big divide between history and faith. So, like I said, sometimes archaeologists or people study history, they reject the miraculous. I've talked about this before. They have a worldview where they won't accept the miracles of the Bible. Therefore, they're going to have a hard time accepting some of the events in the Bible, right? Um, and there's this thing in, in archaeology and history called the principle of analogy, where they think unless you can repeat it in the present, whereas some things happen in the past, if you can't re repeat it in the present, then it didn't happen in the past. So they think unless we see like resurrections today, it must not have happened in the past. Unless we see people 
uh, giving sight to the blind, it must not happen in the past. So that's kind of a silly criteria, but that's just the way sometimes historians are with their stubborn modernism. So anyway, now I gave an example of, um, I talked a little bit about minimalism. And when I was in Israel, this guy's name came up a lot because he teaches at Tel Aviv. He's a professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv. He's actually Jewish. His name's Israel Finkelstein. Um, he's a well-known archaeologist, and he's he wrote this book called The Bible and Earth a long, really quite a ways back. I think it was like the early 90s. But he's what we call minimalist, meaning that um, remember, he's not he's not a believer. I think he's actually just a Jewish, like a secular Jewish person, just culturally Jewish, no strong belief in God or anything. But uh, he believes that only a bare minimum of the Bible is historically trustworthy. That was that's what it means to be a minimalist. Okay, and so minimalists are more skeptical of the text. Um, you know, they they just have such a high standard of what can be found in archaeology. They want everything to be rock certain sometimes. So, um, or they just you know they're just just hyper skeptical. Um, now, a guy named Kenneth Kitchen. This is a great book, by the way, if you can get it. Um, when he wrote the book on the reliability of the Old Testament, he's actually, he's passed away now. He actually critiqued, uh, Finkelstein in his book here. And he said that Finkelstein was in, you know, his, his co-writer were very misinformed. And so he was pretty critical of Finkelstein. Um, and he talked about that in the book. You want to get the reliability of the Old Testament, kind of compare Finkelstein's work with Kitchen's work. Kitchen did, there's been a lot of critiques of Finkelstein. Like I, in Israel, there's other archaeologists who don't necessarily agree with him. But the point is, he has his um, popularity. He's got some popularity in Israel because he's been there for a long time and he's well known there. But anyway. OK, well, there's me overlooking. See the Temple Mount in the background. There's Jerusalem and I'm on the I'm on the Mount of Olives there overlooking um, behind me. If you look down there, I'll show you more of that. See all those white boxes there? They look like uh, white boxes, actually tombs. That's a giant Jewish cemetery, as I'll talk to you about more in a minute. But I am on the Mount of Olives right there. You can see the city is behind me over there with the Dome of the Rock and everything. I was on my way over there for the next day. And then on the right, here I am with probably the top highlight of, I would say, going to Israel is floating on the Dead Sea. Okay, I have to admit it. That floating there for 45 minutes... Literally, you cannot move. You can't be turned over. You can't be pushed under. You can't get tired. You, you, it's just, it's perfect. So it's the coolest thing ever. So if you go to Israel, go to the Dead Sea. We had a hotel right on the Dead Sea. And I walked down there one day. And if you go to the Dead Sea, the issue is that um, they have this high salinity of, you know, uh, the, the salt minerals, right, that concentrate at the bottom of the lake. And so it's so salty, um, you can't inhale the water, right, because you'll get sick. But I mean, when you walk out to go into the Dead Sea, the, it's kind of like rocky, with, it's like salt rock. It's like you, your feet will, you'll kill your feet. And so I didn't bring water shoes with me because I didn't know. So what I did is I first walked in and I said, this isn't going to work. So I found another location like down to the right here. And I found a spot that was really smooth walking out the Dead Sea. It was much smoother. And then I got to my spot right here and I just, I floated for like 45 minutes, just staring up at the sky, not worried about anything. So it is the coolest thing you ever experience. So um, anyway, that was one of my highlights of Israel is definitely the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. I mean, the scenery is absolutely beautiful, okay? Now, when you get out of the Dead Sea, you feel really oily. Uh, you feel really greasy, okay? And you have to go immediately take a shower. Like, when I got out, I went right to the shower on the beach and just, you know, got myself wet because it was so gross. And my shorts, I feel like I had to nuke them. Honestly, they were so gross. So, but anyway, so the Dead Sea is really cool. If you can go float on the Dead Sea, is definitely a highlight. But anyway, um, yes, I got on a camel. I have to admit it. That's my friend Dusty. She's from Arizona. She was with her husband there. But yes, we took a little camel ride there. I I, call, I kept calling her old Dusty. I said, come on, Dusty. Let's get on the candle. But anyway, she just um, beat ovarian cancer. So she was pretty happy to be in Israel. That's my group right there on the right. We're by the Temple Mount. That's in front of the Temple Mount. That's where, that's a Muslim area. You cannot go up there and pray 
and you can't have a Bible study in the Muslim area. It's a no-no. Okay. Our, our tour guide, Dan, tried to pray there and they overheard him one day. They overheard him. The Muslim, one of the Muslims came up and told him you can't pray here. So they're really adamant about that. Okay. So we have people with us from all over the country. There are people from Texas, Arizona, North Carolina. Um, but anyway, so that's just a couple pictures. I don't want to put up tons of pictures of myself. But most importantly in Israel, I went to the Elvis restaurant. Look, Elvis Presley is on fire in Israel. He is so cool there. So anyway, they have an Elvis restaurant, an Elvis diner we went to. And I had a nice big cheeseburger there. And it was really good. So anyway, Elvis is big in Israel. How about that? I just want to share that. Okay, so now I got through that. Let's talk about some of the archaeological discoveries, some of the things that I thought were really cool. Um, one of the first day we went there, we went to uh, Herod's palace, where his palace remains are, the actual King Herod, where they found the remains of his palace. And this is a newer thing they found, a newer uh, discovery over the last um, couple of years. And this may be, they're called the prison of Caesarea. This may be where Paul was imprisoned. Okay. Okay. Because um, it, this is by, this is the palace where Herod's palace would have been. That's see that, that flooring there, the mosaic floor that's still there. They found that. Isn't that cool? It's actually they found that that's still there. Um, that's from the first century. Okay. That would be the location of Herod's palace. And the reason um, they think that may be a location for Paul's prison imprisonment is because the book of Acts records Paul being held in Herod's praetorium for the year for the for the uh, time before uh, being sent to Rome. And so this may be a place where where Paul may have been in prison. They found these little underneath the ground, these little holes like these looks like some kind of cave or something where someone could be kept in. So like I said, if they're not dogmatic about it, but it's 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 a possibility. Okay, so that's a newer discovery they made. It's kind of cool. Um, anyway, uh, now let me mention something about Bethlehem. So when we went to Bethlehem, now you think of Bethlehem, that's where Jesus was born, right? Um, Bethlehem's a little depressing, to be honest, uh, because it's for me personally, it was at least it was it's in the uh, West Bank. And as you know, the West Bank, if you don't know this, it's mostly Palestinian controlled. So Bethlehem is predominantly Palestinian. OK. Um, tourists are welcome there. They'll let tourists come in. Jews do not go into Bethlehem, though. Generally, Jews do not go into Bethlehem very, very rarely. Um, but we went to the Church of Nativity. That's where supposedly Jesus's birth is, this location. But. If you notice everyone crowded around there, like we couldn't get in to see this because the line was like two hours long and I we're not going to wait to go up to the actual hole there where possibly it was his birth. Um, but let me say this, uh, my observation is some of these sites and when I, I'll show you the church of um, the Holy Sepulchre Church, um, a lot of Christians like shrine, they enshrine these places. There's there's lots of Orthodox Christians, there's Armenian Christians, there's Catholics, there's Eastern Orthodox. Um, they put all their relics up around these locations. I mean, it becomes like a Christian, like worship place in a way, <laughs> some of these locations. So you'll see a lot of the symbols and the stuff all around these locations when you go in. Um, but anyway, this I thought was one of the coolest things. This is a newer find. Um, this is called the McDowell Synagogue, and this is found in 2021. So what happened is they went in to excavate this area for a hotel. He ended up finding a first century synagogue. Okay, and this is located on the shore of the Sea of Galilee um, on the site of ancient Magdala. Okay, and so um, if you can see, let me push this up for me. Yeah, Magdala was an ancient Jewish city on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, five kilometers, three miles north of Tiberias. I was in Tiberias too. But this is, if you look at the way, if you can see my arrow, I don't know if you can see it on here. Can you see my arrow circling there? Larry, can you nod your head? Yes. You see that arrow? Okay, cool. So this area right in here, these this area right in here would be where the elders would sit right in here. And then the public would be more on the outside around this location right in here circling around there. And then the person who would speak 
would go up to this area right here. This is a replica of the Bema right here where they would have opened the scroll and read right from there, you know, like Jesus does in Luke 4. So that's the way the synagogue would have been laid out right there. The entryway was over here, but um, it's really cool they found this. I mean, look at that, look at that mosaic, that flooring that's still in place there. They found this 2000 years old, first century. Now this, like I said, this is a more recent discovery. Now, would Jesus be in the synagogue? Was he there? We don't know for sure. He might have been, but he we know that he spent a lot of time in Galilee. Um, there's another view of it right there. There's another picture from another angle. See, they would have, the elders would have been sitting around here, and then the public would have been more on the outside, right in here, and then the speaker would have been right around there. So that's pretty cool. You know, just to be like going to excavate for a hotel and all of a sudden you find a first century synagogue. Well, I guess we're not building a hotel here. <laughs> so that didn't work out. Um, so that's pretty cool. And, you know, Jesus might may have possibly visited it. You know, Magdala is only about six miles, six miles from Capernaum. Um, there are more than 200 villages in Galilee and the gospel say Jesus walked uh, through Galilee. Now, that's another thing that stuck out to me when I was there is... When we traveled from Capernaum, we were by the Sea of Galilee. We were at these different locations is how Jesus might have gotten around, you know, how he did his ministry. I mean, obviously, some places we know he took a boat. You know, we read that in the scriptures. But if he was walking and other times that he had a ways to walk. Some of these places were not, you know, right next to each other, like a 10 minute walk. I mean, he would have done a lot of walking. OK, and so. That kind of struck out to me. That was kind of interesting, just the ge geography of everything. Now, um, there was another uh, synagogue found at the same in the same area back in 2009. OK, so there's like two synagogues. The other one was more recent. OK, so. Um, you know, like I say, on the bottom there, although McDowell is not specifically referenced as a hometown Mary Magdalene in the Bible, most scholars accept her name means Mary from magdala okay so anyway something to think about it's kind of interesting but there's another one there as well there's two synagogues all right i went here too this was in capernaum as well this is called the capernaum synagogue also known as the white synagogue now this was probably um built around fourth or fifth century this is later uh but what they really mo most archaeologists believe that it's on top of a first century synagogue they built this on top of a first century synagogue, which had been more like the one that Jesus would have been around the first century. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of times it happens in some of these locations you go to in Israel, um, they find an important site and then Christians come in, whether it be Byzantine or whether it be Hella, Constantine's wife, and they come and they build something like right on top of it. They're like build a church or build a monastery or build something that's really significant it's interesting you know what i mean like like a memorial or something just they just come right in and like build something right on top of it so it's fascinating um that happened hella's had a heck of a hella was you'll see hella she had a big influence in some of these things so kind of interesting um now i was on the top of mount of, mount of olives here like i said this was kind of cool for me now see i, I assured you this picture um so they made this, uh, when you walk around the Mount of Olives, they also made this giant um, concrete model. It's not like a little model. See the, peop see the people over here, right around the corner, they're overlooking it. I was right there. You can look down and see this giant replica of Jerusalem, what it would look like at the time of Jesus. Like there's the temple right here in the mid, let me go back there. There's a temple right there. And then there's all this other, you know, see the surroundings. So they made this giant concrete diagram model it's so cool. So, you know, you can look down and see exactly what it would have looked like. Um, so that was pretty cool, just looking down there. Now, the Mount of Olives, like we were up here, that's that's where I was sitting there. There's all I'll explain all these tombs, but it extends all the way this way and it goes that way too over there a bit. So Mount of Olives stretches a bit of a ways on the left and right here, but that's where Jesus, of course, ascended to the Father. I'll talk about that. This is a church on the bottom we went to. I think it was called All Nations Church. We went in there for a minute. But uh, but anyway, see all these tour buses? There they all are. See, they're all lined up um, as usual. So now we know from Acts 1 
that the Mount of Olives, of course, like I said, is where Jesus ascended to be with God. And we know the end of Zechariah where that's where Jesus will return, right? That's that's where it talks about he'll put his feet on the Mount of Olives. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to be somewhere up in here, this range, right up in here, up way up high. Okay, now going this way, going you can't see my arrows going that. That's that's the direction of where the temple was and the city and everything going down the hill, going that way. Okay, now the Bible talks about an earthquake and all that stuff will happen, but that's where Jesus will come back. If you believe that, which I believe, I don't think he's coming back to L.A. or Chicago or Columbus, Ohio, right? Anyway, or Salt Lake City. Okay, I think some Christians actually think that though sometimes. Okay, now these tombs. Look at all these tombs. Look at that. These are all tombs where my where my arrow is. Look at that surrounding the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is here, and then you go down all around. Thousands and thousands of Jewish tombs. Um, probably around seventy to one hundred fifty thousand Jewish tombs. Okay, all around there. Okay, um, it's amazing. Okay, when you're there, it's so sobering. You look at all these tombs because you can almost picture. Like the resurrection, look at there's some rabbis, they're burying someone there. These are all Jewish tombs, no Gentiles in there, as far as I know. And you kind of just picture like the resurrection, you know, Jesus, when everyone is risen, you know, gets, you know, the, the corporate resurrection thing at the end, when everyone, the tombs are raised up, people come out of their tombs. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Um, but, you know, some of these tombs have rocks on them right there. If I'm, my arrow's on it. That's a very famous person if they put rocks on top of someone who maybe like a famous rabbi or had a big influence. But these tombs are, it just extends all over. Look at all these tombs going all around there. That's a lot of Jewish tombs. So that was pretty, pretty interesting um, to see that. Okay. Now, we did see the pull of uh, Beseda, Beseda, um, Beseda. This was something that's been found for a while. This isn't incredibly a new find, um, but this is the part from when you read about in John chapter uh, five, John chapter five, verse three to four. Um, what you find a lot of these areas, you find mikvahs. That's where the ritual ba uh, bathing places were for Jews. That's where we get baptism from, the actual water areas. They go down and dip in there and everything. Um, but these are pretty visible and that, that's not, really a new find, but we did get to see that. That was pretty cool. Um, there's another location. That's a better view right there. So that's, um, like I said, it appears to have been more of like the, these mikvahs are there, these ritual baths. So that's where Jesus tells the, uh, you know, Jesus heals the paralytic man in John chapter five. So that's kind of interesting, but yeah, that's, that's been there for a while. That's not a new find. You can see that. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's a location on the map where it would have been right here. The pools compared to the temple where it would be located. That's the temple mount, and that's the pool right there. All right. This was pretty cool. This was a highlight, too. Um, the pool of um, Salam, the one from John chapter, um, uh, the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9. So... This was found, this area right here, a ways ago. This, this is the entryway into the pool right here. They found this a ways back, okay? This right here, okay? Now, this is what it would look like probably at the time of Jesus, the pool, okay? This is kind of a glimpse of what it really would look like uh, when, it was, when it was there, okay? So it refers to a number of rock cut pools, um, and it's outside the walls of the old city to the southwest, but... They're fed by the waters of the Gihon Spring, okay, carried there by a tunnel. I did get to see that tunnel as well. But this is what's really cool, what's going on there. That's another picture looking up what it would have looked like um, in the past. Kind of looks like, hey, let's go swimming. Um, but this is what's cool. So that's our tour guide there, Dan. He's teaching from there. So like I said, this is the entryway right here going down into the pool. They're excavating right now. There's excavations going on right when we were there that day. They're trying to find the rest of this pool area right in here. That would be the pool right there, going extending that way. So they're doing excavations right now. We always had this entryway right here where my where Dan's standing, our guide, going down to the pool. Now they're digging for the the larger part of it. They're digging for like this, all this. Okay, we have like the entryway 
coming right here, going down, but they're looking for the rest of this part right here. So that's pretty cool um, going on right now as we were there. So the Galilee boat was pretty cool. I got to see this. I'd heard about this. I have pictures of this, the, uh, the boat they found in 1986 that is a first century ancient fishing boat that would have been similar to the one Jesus would have been in. Um, they had a whole diagram of how they found this and preserved it. It's it's amazing how they found this and how they had everything they had to go through to try to keep this preserved, with the chemicals they used and everything. Um, what happened was there was a drought at the, at the Sea of Galilee and these two guys, two brothers noticed this oval shape sticking up through the mud um, it was like at a point and then they went and looked at it. it looked like a little, like a part of a boat. And so they called people in and sure enough, um, this ancient boat was under the mud and, you know, they had to figure out how to get it out of there, how to preserve it. Cause it's so delicate not to break it. They had to use all these chemicals. There's a big, you can look it up online that the process they had to go through to preserve this boat. So that was pretty cool. I mean, that ex and it's very, like I, like they say, it's a first century fishing boat similar to the one Jesus would have been in. Whether he was in this one, I don't know. But, you know, of course, they had a lot of fishermen then. Fishermen, of course, and Jesus, um, of course, went out on boat as well. So that was really cool to see that. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, Qumran. I don't know how much you guys know about this, but I got to see this site. And this has always been an interest of mine because... I was studying this years ago and I'd, I'd seen lectures on it. I went to a lecture in Cleveland on it. I went to a lecture at our old congregation on it. Actually, I think we had two guys, scholars, come speak on it. So this, this isn't, isn't anything new. It's not new information. But um, if you want to get this book here, this is a good, um, good book starting point. But so what happened is there's these groups of there's a group of Jews called the Essenes, and they break away from the religious establishment. They think that the priesthood in the temple is corrupt. They think their leadership is corrupt in general, the Jewish leadership. And they break away and go out to the desert and they start their own community. OK, and they uh, they're very eschatological, meaning that they think. The judgment is coming, that God's going to bring judgment, and he'll only preserve the righteous, the righteous remnant, the Jews who are the righteous ones that are pure. And uh, they believe in actually two different messiahs, one who's priestly and one who's royal. Um, they have a teacher called the teacher of righteousness. And I did see these caves. I saw the, these are the caves right up in here where they found these scrolls right in here. And you know how it happened. There was a young Arab shepherd boy who was looking for his... Uh, goat i believe might have been a sheep i think i have it written down here his goat yeah and he threw a rock in this cave and he heard something he heard it hit something like a weird sound and he ended up going in there and sure enough that's where these manuscripts were found and that led to the greatest archaeological discovery probably in the last 80 to 90 years or more and this, so I did get to see these caves. I mean, I didn't get to walk like, you know, we can go up there right there. I, I was looking over a balcony looking at these. So that was really cool. Um, found in 1947. That's where the they located this right here. There's the location on the map right here. Okay. So anyway. So uh, there was a, uh, a Dominican monk. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his name, Vox. I'll just say his last name, Pierre Roland de Vox. There, I tried. Um, but he was the original archaeologist who conducted the excavations from 1951 to 1956. And he said, you know, there's this religious sect of Judaism that habit this area um, known as the Essenes. And he did a lot of researching on the, um, the, the this entire site. OK, and look, we have a diagram of the site and i got to see some of this i got to walk literally around here and see some of this okay and how cool is this so there's like a meeting hall dining hall you know there's um places they bathe where they you know they obviously have to stay pure there there's a there's a mikvah right there that's the mikvah um there's a cistern where the water comes in somehow i mean there's they found all this 
Okay, this is really cool. And there I was, I was walking, that'd be an area I was walking uh, around right there. Uh, but that's how they would channel the water into there from the cliffs in the west. Um, the, you know, that, that you figure out how they get the water in the ritual baths, the mikvah, because the clean, cleansing in the ritual bath with the mikvahs are very important. Okay, that's part of their community, the ritual purity issue. Okay, very big into purity, their purity community. Some people think John the Baptist may have been in a scene. There's been some debate about this for a while because he was not far from this community. Um, you know, he was out in the desert. Um, the only difference is John seems to, his message is for, he's baptizing in the Jordan. He's welcoming all people, whereas the Essenes were very, very separatist. You know what I mean? Kind of cultic where they they wouldn't interact with other people groups. And so they kind of broke away from it. They were, John is going to the people and he's preaching to, to, to different, you know, a lot of different people right there. So there's some possibilities John was connected with them, but it's not rock solid for sure. But it's kind of interesting. Um, because they were they were this group was against the religious establishment, against they were rebuking the uh really upset with the Jewish leadership. You know, John was upset with the Jewish leadership as too. He's rebuking the religious leaders as well. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Um okay, yeah, there's a little more about the water. Um, how it came down here. They found this. Yeah, this is where the water would come down right here. Okay, let's go to something else here. Uh, these are the steps into one of the mikvahs. Um, it's consistent with the major earthquake which struck the area in 31 BC, which we know probably was the one associated with what happened with Yeshua, with Jesus. There's the, uh, the area where they have the communal meal. The dining hall probably was right in here. So... It's kind of interesting. Um, more about their water. That's the cistern area. Anyway, All right, let's talk a little about the scrolls that were found. So there are 11 caves. Um, they found 900 biblical and non-biblical texts composed of tens of thousands of manuscript uh, fragments. So there's over 220 texts of the Hebrew Bible, except the book of Esther. Uh, the scrolls are written in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, dating from 250 BC to AD 68. Um, there are also over 400 apocryphal and pseudepigraphal uh, scrolls. That's the you know you, you talk about the apocryphal literature and the pseudepigraphal literature. That's some of the stuff that's written between both the New Testaments. I, I mean, between the time of the Old and New Testament, right? You have that gap period of time called the intertestamental period. You can read all those pseudepigraphal writings. You can read the apocryphal writings as well. Um, but what's cool is they found a complete book of Isaiah, which now is probably the oldest copy we have of Isaiah. Um, they found a commentary in Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk, I'm sorry. Uh, they found... Things like had their own writings on them, like their titles, like they have something called like the Thanksgiving scroll, the manual of discipline. They have their own writings as well. Um, but then they, of course, they have fragment stuff from stuff like Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges, Samuel, Daniel, Psalms, other things. OK. Uh, cave two was not quite as productive what they found there, but they did have some fragments where they found. Uh, fragments including two of Exodus, one of Leviticus, four of Numbers, two of Deuteronomy, one of Jeremiah, Job, and Psalms, and two of Ruth. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And K4 was probably the most productive caves with, I mean, had the most information in them. They found 100 biblical books containing more than 50,000 fragments. Okay. And so some of the fragments were Genesis, Daniel 7 28. Commentaries on Psalms, Isaiah, and others. Um, so that was pretty cool. By the way, you can go to the museum there in Israel. You can see all this stuff, like all about the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's really cool. But they, like I said, they did have their own view of a Messiah. Um, this is discovered in K4 that uh, there's Messianic passages they have from the from the Hebrew Bible identifying Messiah as a prophet, priest, and king. Um, they don't say Jesus per se, but they do have some similarities 
um, between what we believe. So it gave you some idea of messianic expectations pre-Jesus, right? This is pre-Jesus, not after Jesus, okay? This is one of the, the scrolls they found. It sounds a heck of a lot like Matthew 11. This is in 4Q521, the scroll they found. It says, heaven and earth will obey his Messiah and all that is in them and will not turn away from the commandments of the holy ones. For the Lord will honor the pious upon the throne of the eternal kingdom, setting prisoners free, opening the eyes of the blind, raising up those who are bowed down. For he will heal the wounded, revive the dead, proclaim good news to the poor. Well, we could say that they were falling back on Isaiah 35. It's a prophecy about some of the miracles of the Messiah. They could be looking at that. Who knows? But it sounds a heck of a lot like what John wrote or Matthew wrote in Matthew chapter 11. Isn't that kind of interesting? <laughs> anyway. Now, as far as what that did for the reliability of the Bible, um, we have what's, when you think of the Old Testament, you have what's called the Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint. Okay, the Greek Septuagint was translated by um, a bunch of rabbis, yes, but some Jews have a higher view of the Masoretic text than the Greek Septuagint, just depends on who you talk to. Uh, if you talk to the, probably if you talk to Orthodox Jews who don't believe in Jesus, they're not going to have a very high view of the Septuagint. They're going to, because they know Christians used it so much in the New Testament, and they're quoting Messianic prophecy. They're looking at the Greek Septuagint a lot of times. But the Masoret, they're going to have a higher view of the Masoretic text. But the point is that before discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls, Scholars would translate the Old Testament from the Masoretic text. It dated from about 900 AD, called the Aleppo Codex, and later 1300 years from the end of the Old Testament, 400 BC. So when you ask how accurate was the copying process during that 1300 year interval, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they find, the, the, the ones they have of the Old Testament, the manuscripts, they found out this is about 95% identical to the actual Masoretic text that they were using, okay? And some of these manuscripts like Isaiah are older, okay, even older, okay? So that means we have even earlier manuscripts that are closer to the time period, right? So they're even, it, it even helps our case. You know, you have, you have manuscripts that are dated even closer um, than, um, you know, than the older ones. So if anything, it'll be it just even somewhat strengthen some of the things, the things we know from the Old Testament as far as the manuscript evidence, okay? Um, so the, the, the Qumran is a pretty cool study. If you want to, like I said, go back and read that book at the beginning, I said. It's a really cool study if you want to, there's been more than enough read, written, um, lectured on. You can find lectures, all kinds of stuff. So it's pretty cool. I talked about this before in previous talks about the Caiaphas ossuary. So they found these Jewish ossuaries. These are the tombs the Jews would have been buried in. Um, they found a lot of these ossuaries in Israel. These have been discovered. One of them, they believe this is the actual one that has, um, or Caiaphas, the priest from Matthew chapter 14, that was the one who Jesus went before the Sanhedrin trial. They believe this is his ossuary, ossuary where he's buried. Um, so they found this because of this the um, the writing on the side. They were able to translate it. So that's that's kind of interesting. They also found one that's probably his daughter as well um, from his daughter's uh, ossuary as well. So anyway, this you know the the um, the inscription on the side says Miriam, daughter of Yeshua, son of Caiaphas. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, I did see this Golgotha. That's the possible site of Jesus's crucifixion. I wouldn't say they're dogmatic about it. It's a possibility. Um, I was right there. I looked at it. It's like I said, it's kind of debated whether it was or not. Um, there's another location in the church of Holy Sepulcher, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is probably more likely, um, so when it came to looking at the uh, the tomb, possible tomb locations, uh, I did see both of them. The garden tomb, which is in a garden, which you can go to. I went right in. I went right inside here, by the way. I got to go right in here. And it just, there's a little chamber in here. You go to the right and it looks like where you could lay a body. Yes. But 
The problem with this location is it's dated probably uh, about fifth century, much later. They discovered it much later on. Um, so the dating's a bit late to make that out to be a possible location of Jesus's tomb. I know some of you are saying, who cares? He's risen. It doesn't matter if they find the location. You're right. So he is risen from the dead. So we all know that. Um, but I think the Church of the Holy Sepulchre site probably is the more likely location if it if it is there. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which I went in, um, it's built, like I said, they come and they build these churches. It's built on a traditional site of Jesus's crucifixion and burial. Um, since the Bible talks about the tomb being close to the place of crucifixion, the church was planned to enclose uh, the site of both the cross and tomb of Jesus. Now you see this part right here. I could not, if you go around the corner here, you go inside it, that's where the possible location is of Jesus's um, tomb. Now, I could not get in there because the line was like three hours long and I wasn't going to wait. This whole circle was just packed with people and I just, we weren't going to do that. But it's a zoo in here when you go in the church of the Holy Sepulcher. Um, so you can see right now, look at the Orthodox Christians there. They're participating in a holy fire, uh, what's called a holy fire ceremony. Um, so see, a lot of Christian groups say, the more I say the non-evangelical groups, like the Orthodox, the Catholics, the Arminians, they really get into these locations, like, and, you know, putting up their decorations around them and things like that. So see what they did right here. I mean, this thing right here, they built this whole thing where the tomb is supposedly located inside in this thing, you know, the, the location of Jesus's burial. So what happens is, what happened to the Church of Holy Sepulchre, the history is that the Romans, they destroyed Jerusalem at the end of the first century. And then supposedly, maybe in the second century, they built a pagan temple there in that location. So what happened is by the fourth century, Constantine's mother, remember Constantine, he's the one that made Christianity in a state religion, right? His mother, Helena, came in. And she started looking for these possible locations of Jesus's crucifixion and burial. So she orders a church to be built right on that location. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? Um, and so that's what they do. You know, they come in, they just build something. So that's kind of interesting. So that's what they did there. That's why the church is there. Um, you can go see this. This is like possibly where the Rock of Calvary, it's like encased in a gl some glass there. You can see it when you that like right in here. That that's the glass. It's in there. I saw that. Um, so I mean, you know, I I think it's a possibility these locations are there. I mean, I mean, these these are it's somewhere in that vicinity, I think, somewhere, obviously, that the side of Jesus' crucifixion and his his bear or his tomb, but you know, it's not 100 percent dogmatic, and in the end, I know it doesn't matter terribly um whether we find it but you know because we know he's risen from the dead but anyway um i saw the kidron valley this is the, on the east side of the temple mount um this be considered a place of burial by christians muslims and jews since before the uh, babylonian exile um it's also known as the valley jehoshaphat which is a traditional site was prophesied by joel to be the final place of god's final judgment on the nation so it's also a place where David and Jesus um, were betrayed by their inner circle. So I was at that location, the Kidron Valley. I did see that. So that was kind of cool. There I am in front of the Temple Mount, uh, pointing to that giant mosque that is there. So this is kind of interesting because it's believed that obviously the mosque is built on top of the original location of the temple, right? Where the temple was, the temple that Jesus was in, right? They built this mosque on top of it. Um, so there's a guy named Rittmeyer, who's an archaeologist, and he has this location here where he thinks the Holy of Holies is, the location of the Holies of Holies underneath. He thinks it's underneath the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount. Um so that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, he thinks that's where it's located right there. But at the end of the day, here's what's going on in Israel. So you do have some Jews there that want a third temple. If you go to the Temple Institute website, you can read about it there. It's called, just go to the Temple Institute online. 
There are some Jews that do want a third temple. They have everything they need for a third temple. Everything except a location and a way to break ground. Because <laughs> they can't break ground in this location because there's going to be a war, right? If they try to go in here and try to erect a temple here, try to rebuild a temple where the Dome of the Rock is, where the this mosque is, it's going to cause World War III, right? So... I would say the group of Jews that want a third temple are not in the majority, but it is growing from what my what Dan told me, our Jewish guide. He said there is a growing number that want a third temple. They have the red heifer. They have everything. Now, you may say, well, what would they do? Go back to sacrifices? Um, yes, they would. <laughs> they have every they know who the priest would be. They have it all laid out. Uh, people are qualified to be priests and everything. Now, let me say again. This is not the majority of Israel that wants us. The secular Jewish people could care less. They think it's disgusting to go back to a temple with sacrifice. They think it's absolutely barbaric and gross. Um, as Christians, we know we don't need another temple because Jesus is the temple and we have sacrifices been fulfilled in him. Now, depending on your eschatology, whatever you believe about the future, some Christians have always believed traditionally that there will be a third temple. The Antichrist will make himself known in there, and then we'll get into the abomination of desolation passages, and he'll desecrate the temple, and he'll be a false messiah figure, and there, so there will be a physical temple one day, but then it'll be desecrated, of course, by the Antichrist. So however that's going to play out, you know, a third temple of some kind, I don't know, but there's certainly some Jews there that do want a third temple, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Um that's a uh, reconstruction of the Temple Mount, you know, what it would have looked like at the time of Jesus. So Jesus would have been probably walking along right out here. You know, that's where he probably got mad at the money changers right in that area, right in there on the outer courts right in here. OK, so anyway. All right. And by the way, that was a massive structure. This was a massive structure that was destroyed by the Romans. It was an absolutely massive structure. Okay, uh, I did see this area, the city of David. Um, I, you know, I went around all this area, so that was pretty cool. Um, let me mention they did find this Herod inscription um, near Masada, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, actually, at Masada, this is the uh, there's a piece of pottery given the full name, title, and place of um, the rule of Herod the Great. Okay, so they have found that. They also found. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But this was really cool, though, going to Masada. Um, look how high up that is. I went there. You have to take a trolley car to get to the top. Now, you can climb up there. There's a uh, these there's these steps that go up there. There's like actual steps you can climb up there. You guys are saying, how in the world would anybody do that? One of the guys from our tour climbed the steps. He actually, uh, we were on the trolley car going up there and we were looking down on him as he was climbing the steps. His name was Mike. Then we got to the top. And you know what our tour guide told Mike? He said, you're not climbing to the bottom. You're coming with us on the way down because you're holding up the tour. So anyway, so Masada is a, um, it was a fortress. It's still there. It's a fortress in the Judean desert overlooking the Dead Sea. But um, it was built as a palace complex by Herod the Great who reigned 37 to 4 BC. And so this became like a place that was the last stand for some Jews against a Roman army. Um, and what happened was after Herod's death in the annexation of Judea, the Romans built this, uh, the, built, they put a garrison there. Basically, they put some people there at Masada, okay? And so you had a group of Jew, uh, Romans there, not a large group, not like a giant Roman army at Masada. But what happened is when uh, the Jews revolted against Rome, remember there's been more than one revolt for the Jews revolt against Rome because they're under Roman rule. Um, when, a, one of the, when this revolt broke out in 66 AD, a group of Jews called the Zealots, remember the Zealots, they're the ones that always want Rome, uh, want to raise up a revolt to overtake Rome. And Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not my, it's not the way we're going to do things. I'm not going to lead a revolt. I'm not going to lead a physical revolt. That's not the way to do it. Well, the zealots lead a group of people up to Masada. 
and they they basically get rid of the Roman soldiers that are there. They basically take them out, which they're not a lot there, but they take them out and they take over Masada. They're basically hiding in Masada. Um, and so they're basically refusing to surrender. They're hiding up, they're hiding up in this place in Masada. It's like a fortress, okay? And so a Roman army finally comes to take them out, but it's not easy. Um, it took about two years to actually for them to get the remaining Jews out of there which weren't a lot of Jews there, uh, maybe a thousand at most with their bows and arrows and everything, including women and children. What happened was when the Jews knew the Romans were going to overtake them, they basically just took their lives. The, the Jews ended up taking their lives, a lot of them. So it's kind of a sad story, but they were the, they were called the, uh, the zealots. Okay. So yeah, going up there, I was right up in here. There's the, the going up to the top. There's my a friend of mine. We took a picture at the top and you get to see the remains of Masada. So we were really high up. And that was that was really cool. Beautiful scenery. And then they found uh, this other thing called the Herodium. Um, this is a cone-shaped mound south of Jerusalem that was built as a palace by Herod. Destroyed in AD 71 by the Romans. But Herod's tomb was discovered here. Um, and by the way, let me mention, if you want to know a lot about Jewish history and the time of Jesus and this whole, all the stuff I'm talking about, you need to read Josephus. You need to have Josephus's um, antiquities on you. Okay, a lot of Josephus's writings play a huge role in how Jewish archaeologists study this stuff and how our archaeologists try to understand what was going on. Okay, so you need to be reading Josephus if you're interested and you like history. I talked about the Pilate inscription. I did see this. Um, this was the... Uh, an inscription they found of the actual B pilot that ordered Jesus's crucifixion. Um, so I've talked about this before. Nothing really new here. That's you can see that when you're there. Pretty cool. Um, let me talk a little bit about just some practical issues with Israel today. Uh, remember that um, there's about 15 to 16 million Jewish people worldwide. A lot of them, of course, are dispersed all across the world, plenty in the U.S. as well. Um, you run into Jewish people, of course, some of them are all uh, Orthodox. I'll talk more about that in a minute. There's tons of, if you go to Israel, you're surrounded by Orthodox Jews, especially in Jerusalem. They're all around you. Um, the modern Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, as I'll talk about in a minute. But then Israel has a lot of secular Jewish people as well. Then there's conservative, secular Jewish people are like Reformed the liberal branch of Judaism. Then you have conservatives, uh, conservative Judaism, which is not obviously orthodox, not reform kind of in the middle. And then you have reconstructionalism. That's kind of a weird thing. But um, so for Jewish people, um, by the way, I did go to the Holocaust Museum in Israel. I did get to see the Holocaust Museum. It was very, very sad, of course, and very sobering. And you just realize that when you look at the countries Hitler went into to try to get the Jewish people, I mean, he went all over Europe, you know, rounding them up, executing them and other people as well. But uh, his plan was just, I mean, it's literally just, uh, it's just, all I can say is just demonic. That's all it is, it's just pure demonic, purely demonic. I mean, it was pure evil. So a lot of Jewish people there are just trying to still survive, you know, because they're aware that that could happen again, of course. Um, but one of the key components of Jewish identity is non-belief in Jesus, meaning that, you know, to believe in Jesus is not to be Jewish. I mean, that's just part of Jewish identity. Now, as you know, there's Jewish believers today who believe. There's about 30,000 Jews who believe in Jesus in Israel right now, About probably about, I think, seven to 800,000 worldwide. I haven't checked the latest stats. But many Jews today are concerned about what's called tikkun olam. That means making the world a better place um, through justice and righteousness, through ethics, very big into ethics, not so much beliefs, like getting perfect beliefs, but ethics and doing the right thing. Um, a lot of big social, a lot of social responsibility. Um when they do good deeds, though, it's not to earn their salvation. They don't really think about salvation the way we do. Um, they, uh, as far as it comes to the Messiah, some of them could care less. You talk to some secular Jewish people who don't believe in God, they could care less about a Messiah. 
Some believe in a messianic age where the world is just a better place and Israel will be at peace and there's not all this war going on and everything. So the world looks fundamentally different from it is now. Some believe in a personal Messiah, some don't. Most of them don't think the Messiah is divine. They think he's just an earthly king. And they think he'll, he will come and lead Israel and be a leader there. And he will help Israel dwell securely in the land. Um, but he's definitely not a God man. Okay. So in the first century, you got to realize there are a lot of Judaisms. Not just Judaism. It's not like Judaism and Christianity. It's like, are you part of Christianity? Are you part of Judaism? They don't have those categories. Okay. They, like we do today in like world religions textbooks where you study Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, they don't think in those categories, okay? If you're Jewish, you're just part of the Jewish world, and you may be part of one of these sects. You may be part of the Essenes, like I showed you, the Essenes, you broke off and went out in the desert. You may be one of the Pharisees, you may be part of the Sadducees, you may be part of the Zealots, or you may decide to join up with Jesus and his followers, who were called the Nazarenes. That's what it says in the book of Acts. Paul was the ring leader of the Nazarenes. We also have possibly 20 other sects or subsects at that time, okay? Now, what happens is through history and time and the issue of our faith evolving out of Israel and also the destruction of the temple in 70 AD is that the Pharisaical Judaism, there's only two sects that survive. Pharisees survive. They become rabbinical Judaism today. And the followers of Jesus evolve into being christianity which is now separate from the jewish starting point really most christianity today has nothing to do with anything jewish you might have noticed that's because of centuries and centuries of de-judaizing the faith we just de-judaized it to the point where it's just there's not much Jew anything jewish about it even though most christians would say yeah jesus was jewish paul was jewish and it, yeah this took place in israel but they don't quite get the full context sometimes. So, of course, you have Messianic Jews today. Messianic Jews are just a continuation of those Jewish followers of Jesus. They're nothing new. They're just a continuation of that, of the uh, the, the Paul and the, the apostles, really. Um, most uh, Orthodox communities in Israel, um, they are very... They're very observant of Jewish law, but they will mix in a little bit with the secular world. They won't separate as much. But when you get to the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox, sometimes called the Herodi Jews, um, they, uh, they're they more separatist, a little more separatist, and a little more stricter, obviously, than modern Orthodox, right? Obviously. So Hasidic Judaism, um, they're more strict, too, a little more um, separatist. They live there in New York as well, but they they definitely very, 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 um, anyway, much more strict, much more observant. So if you go to Israel, one thing you will see is you'll see these posters of this guy right here. They're sometimes on street signs. This is Rabbi um, Schneerson. He passed away in the, in the mid-90s. He was a rabbi in the Hasidic Jewish movement. Um, and within Hasidic Judaism, there's leaders who are called a tazik, uh, which means a righteous man. Okay. And the Rebbe, the rabbi is viewed as like a righteous man. And they view this guy Schneerson as like a tazik. Okay. And when he died in 1994, some of his followers thought that he was going to come back and they actually think he's the Messiah. Okay. So these little posters around here are supposed to be of him like saying, they don't know what he's saying there, but it's a sign that he's really the Messiah. That's like their Messianic figure. It's kind of interesting. There was a table when I went out in Jerusalem, they had a table about him. Um, now, when you go to the Western Wall, where all these Orthodox Jews are, where I was, where I, I got to go down there later on in the day, um, Notice all these Orthodox Jews. These are all Orthodox Jews, mostly, all right here, okay? And you go back in these little sections right here. See these little openings right here? You can. These are prayer rooms. You go back in. There's little Jewish libraries back there, like rabbis praying, sitting there studying the law, studying Torah back in here. Because do you know that in Israel, you can get a, subs a subsidy from the government 
as an Orthodox Jew just to be paid to study. You want to study the Torah or study rabbinical literature as well. They'll pay you to study. And so you get a subsidy for your family and you're poor. You don't get a lot of money, but that's what a lot of these Orthodox guys are doing. They don't work a regular job. They're just studying all day. The secular Jewish people in Israel, they can't stand it because basically their taxpayers are going towards this and they want these Orthodox Jews to get a job. So they're not happy, okay, with these Orthodox Jews. They're all over the place. They're just pay, getting living off the government, okay? So that's kind of a, a point of tension, okay? Now, the one thing that I realized, you know, you, like you guys know, like you go to the wall. If I go to the right here, there's that wall with the little pieces of paper with prayers on them stuck in the wall. Um, all this made me appreciate this that we have direct access to God through the Messiah 24 hours a day, that Jesus has broken down all the barriers. He fulfilled the priesthood. He fulfilled the sacrificial system, and we have direct access to God. We don't necessarily have to go to physical structure, but it also made me very sad to see these Orthodox Jews praying all day long and spending hours and hours doing this, and they don't know their Messiah just hours and hours and it's tragic i mean it's tragic you know that right it's just tragic and that's why um let me skip ahead here to romans 9 you know and paul talks about how he was wished to be cut off from his own from the messiah he, uh, he wished to be cut off or cursed from the messiah so his kinsmen according to the flesh would know their messiah He's having this anxiety about unbelieving Israel in his day, right? He says they have the blessings, they have the covenants, the temple service, the promises, they have all this stuff, and they don't know their Messiah. So he's very, very bothered and troubled. And that's the way I bet he would feel right now. If he looked down here and saw these Orthodox Jews, he'd be saying, oh, you know what I mean? I, I, I'd rather be separated from Messiah so they would know their Messiah. That's how burdened he is. Um. Just a couple of last things. Israel has a population of 9.73 million. Um, that's the latest step from March 2023. 73.5 are Jews of all backgrounds. 21% are Arab. Um, and then you have the remaining 5.5% of a mixed people. Sometimes they're Christians. Remember, there's Arab Christians there too. And uh, let me say also that um, walking away from Bethlehem, um, when I saw those those Palestinians there, and I talked to an Arab Christian there, I'm broken. I'm heartbroken for the Palestinians. You know why? Because they have no leadership. They really don't have any leadership. We gave the Palestinians hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's been embezzled. It's been taken. Um, they've been misled. The people have been, the, you know, they have Hamas, this terrorist organization, but they really don't have any leadership at all. So they don't have any advocate. They don't know when to advocate for them, be an advocate. So, you know, be praying for the Palestinians as well. You know, because a lot of those people are, sadly, the uh, the consequences are there from poor leadership. You know, and they're, they're living out the consequences of having no leadership and poor leadership. So, you know, they're poor. A lot of them, you know, can't make ends meet. It's very difficult. Okay, so let's be praying for them. I also have a friend that is working on Palestinian Jewish relations. He's trying to bring reconciliation there to get people get them dialoguing with each other. Of course, they have a long ways to go. But um, like I said, secular Jewish people are all over Israel. They don't necessarily believe in God. You don't have to believe in God to be Jewish. As I said before, most Jewish, many Jewish people don't believe in God. Um, and you know, that's, that's the way it is in the U S as well. And, um, so anyway, um, remember what Paul says in Romans nine or, or Romans one, he says here, you know, he talks about the gospel. He says here, Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David, according to flesh and declared to be the son of God. So notice how he says, 
This is the gospel. This is the Davidic king. It was talked about in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures. He's a descendant of David. He's declared to be the son of God. And this is the gospel I preach to you. I mean, that that is not a de-Judaized gospel. That is the Jewish gospel for the nations, okay, for all people groups. Then he talks about he has an apostleship to bring about the beings of faith for the sake of the nations, right? Okay. So having said that, um, let's be praying for, uh, you know, Jewish people to come to faith, be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, be praying for the Palestinians. And um, <laughs> I guess it's discussion time. Those are some of the highlights from my trip. There's many, 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 many more things I could share. I have thousands of pictures, but we'd have that would take hours. So we're not going to do that. Um, 